Well, hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to welcome you to another week in the Scriptures uh, with the life of the Savior. This week, we're just going to be in one of the Gospels, and uh, and one of my favorites. Uh, we're going to be studying John chapter 7 through 10. And remember, the goal that I have for you is, is to help you to either study or to teach the scriptures with more relevance and impact and power. I love the scriptures. And so I just feel like it's such a great privilege that I get a chance to spend this time with you each week and share that love that I have for the scriptures with you. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It is time to dig deep. For an icebreaker to our first story, I like to begin by sharing an embarrassing moment. And though that may be a bit intimidating to do as a teacher, I can almost guarantee that your, your class is going to enjoy it. And you could also ask if anybody else in your class would be willing to share one of theirs. And you know, why not? Uh, I'll go ahead and share one of mine here just for fun. I've got so many to choose from. And this is actually a, a, a bit of a recent one. So just a, a year or two ago, uh, while serving as, as the bishop of my ward, I was sitting there on the stand for sacrament meeting, obviously, and one of your jobs as bishop is to make sure that the priests say the sacramental prayers correctly. And so I, I had those memorized, and I would listen carefully to the priest, and afterwards they'd look to me for a second, and I'd give them either the nod, if they said it correctly, or a shake of the head if they needed to do it again. Well, on this particular Sunday, I listened carefully to the prayer on the bread. It was delivered correctly. I gave the nod and the deacons began passing the sacrament. Well, I, I always like to use that time to ponder, to, to pray and focus on, on the Savior, as we should. And so I closed my eyes and bowed my head and I sank deep into thought. Well, at that time, being a very busy person with a lot on my plate, uh, and sometimes having late nights and early mornings, let's just say I started to ponder a little too deeply. And before I knew it, I was out. I fell asleep on the stand and was totally oblivious to the deacons passing the bread to everybody, bringing it back to the priests, and then one of the priests offering the prayer on the water. And, and I'm still out at this point, completely. And the priest finishes the prayer, looks to me, and there I am with my head down, <laughs> still asleep. And from what my wife tells me, the priests didn't know what to do. They were looking at each other and, and looking around. And, and there's this, this awkward moment where they're trying to figure out whether they should just go ahead or, or if they should wait for me. And so my first counselor realizes what's going on. And he bumps me in the ribs and I come to, and, and I'm looking around uh, for a second and trying to figure out where I am, who I am and, and what's happening. And I look to the side and there's the priest wide eyed and looking to me for guidance. And so I gave them a quick nod and the sacrament proceeded. But you know what? I, I have to be honest. I don't know whether the prayer was said correctly or not that time. I hope and pray it was. And I hope that the Lord will forgive me for that, but I guess we'll never know if they did say it right. I still remember looking out over the congregation and seeing some of my ward members trying to suppress their laughter. So that was an embarrassing moment for me, which I can laugh about now, but I'll tell you, in the moment, I felt humiliated in front of the entire congregation, and, and I felt like I just wanted to crawl under my seat and, and hide. And thank heavens that this was during COVID, uh, and I had a mask on to cover my, I'm sure, very red face. Well, that, that's typical of embarrassing moments, right? We don't want everybody to see our mistakes. When we err, it's very natural, very human to want to conceal those things. And then the story from the life of Christ that we're going to take a look at now, we're going to encounter somebody who had made a very serious error, a very serious moral mistake. But that mistake is going to be brought out in front of everyone, including Jesus. 
And what's great about this little story is that we get a chance to see how the Savior reacts to that kind of situation, how he reacts to somebody's mistakes. So let's watch him. And perhaps it can help us to know what we should do when we become aware of other people's sins, their errors, their offenses. And her story is found in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Let's set up the situation by reading verses 1 through 5 together, including the first sentence of, of verse 6, with a question in mind. Why are the scribes and Pharisees doing this? Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. So what are the scribes and Pharisees hoping to accomplish here? They're trying to trap him. It seems like they've always got some scheme up their sleeves to try and make Jesus look bad. And of course, they always fail. Jesus always has the perfect response, the perfect answer. But here, the plan is that if he says, don't do it, then they could accuse him of disregarding the law of Moses, which is everything to the Jews. If he says, do it, then that would make him look more unpopular in the eyes of the people, and perhaps even get him in trouble with the Roman law. So they don't really care about this woman. And, and I would argue that they don't really care much about the law of Moses, or that she's broken a commandment either. They're just using her as a pawn to try to get at Jesus, and so they demand that he judge her. And she is guilty, there, there's no question. And this is where the real value of the story comes into play. We get to see Jesus as judge. He's going to teach us what to do and what not to do when opportunities to judge the mistakes, the sins, and shortcomings of others are presented to us. The story is going to illustrate something that he said just in the previous chapter, John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, that's what he's going to do here. I see at least six different truths about righteous judgment taught by these verses, how to do it. And, and what do you see in the story? Read the rest of the story and come up with as many truths as you can about righteous judgment. And to help you in that search, I'll give you some, some verse numbers where I particularly see a truth, but you can disregard those if you like it. Just, just see what you can find. Dig deep. What truths stand out to you? When I see the mistakes of others, I should or I shouldn't. And here are the verses that, that I would focus on in particular. Verse 3, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11. So as a teacher, I might just write these verses on the board and invite my students to search and, and then share what they find. And then have a, a bit of a discussion about those truths as they're revealed. So here's my thoughts from verse 3. I see a shouldn't in this verse. When the Pharisees and scribes discover her mistake, what do they do? They parade her out in front of everybody else. It says that they set her in the midst. The fact that they're doing this in the temple in his father's house, in front of everybody else, and especially with that air of self-righteousness and lack of compassion, must have been deeply offensive to Jesus. This was not a matter for the entire community to be involved in. But isn't that exactly what we're tempted to do when we become aware of the mistakes of others? We, we gossip about it. We, we tell others that we know. We bring it out into the open, call attention to it. And at worst, 
we ridicule or we denigrate that person in public. In a more public sphere, tabloid magazines are some of the biggest sellers in the country. And what are they full of? The public judgment of others, drawing attention to the mistakes and the sins and the problems of our fellow man. And who cares if they're celebrities? It's not right. <laughs> Jesus, on the other hand, understood that sins, especially those of a serious nature, are personal, private, and confidential matters between God and that individual. Or sometimes God's priesthood leaders and the people directly involved and affected by it. And nobody else. It's not our place to to distribute or, or, or share those things with the world. And if, if we legitimately have an issue that we need to hash out with somebody, we should do it as Jesus suggests in Matthew 18, verse 50. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So if there's truly a problem between us and somebody else, their actions or mistakes are directly affecting us, then we do it in private, not out in front of everybody else. So that's our first principle here. When I see the mistakes of others, I shouldn't set them in the midst or focus public attention on them. Instead, if it's a matter that's none of our business, which is usually the case, perhaps we can do what Jesus does in verse 6. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So what does he do? He ignores them. He acts as if he can't even hear them. He's not going to take the bait or respond to their judgment, which I know is a really hard thing to do. I mean, how are you tempted to react when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear what they did? In those situations, do we do we seek to ignore it? Or do we lean in and we say, ooh, give me all the juicy details? Do we openly criticize or, or call out the mistakes of our friends, our neighbors, our family members in front of other people? Publicize those kinds of things on social media or go around looking for the negative in others and shout what we find from the rooftops. Instead, Maybe we could try a little harder to ignore it, to, to walk away from the gossipy conversation, to stand up for those not present, and instead perhaps focus on the good in others. Let's, let's publicize those things, compliment them in public, defend them in public, shout our praises, but hold back our criticisms. Jesus sought to do that. So when I see the mistakes of others, I should seek to ignore it. Or when others present those kinds of things to me, perhaps I should act as though I heard them not. From verse 7, uh, of course, that, that's not good enough for the Pharisees, so that they're going to push him. They are going to demand a judgment. So, so Jesus does. They ask whether they're justified in stoning her. And and what's Jesus going to say? What do you think? Is he going to say, yes, stone her, or is he going to say, no, don't? If you read the verse carefully, you might be surprised at what his answer is. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So what's his suggestion? Is it to do it or not to do it? It's to do it. Okay, go ahead and stone her. It's in the law of Moses, so do it. But before you do, I want you to consider one thing. He who is without sin, let him go first. Now that's fascinating because it changes the whole dynamic of the situation. He's saying to do it, but to do it in a specific way. Rather than a mob mentality where everybody just grabs rocks and starts throwing, and nobody needs to feel responsible for the condemnation, somebody has to throw the first stone alone. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus 
is really appealing to the actual law of Moses here. There was an order. There were rules to capital punishment, stoning people to death. Uh, check this out in Deuteronomy 17.7. 7. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. And afterward, the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put the evil away from among you. And you can you can probably see the wisdom in that kind of system. What effect do you think that would have? If you were going to bring an accusation against somebody, but you knew that you were going to have to be the person to first cast the stone, how might that affect your decision? This was probably an effort to keep people from making frivolous or false accusations. It'd make you think twice. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I would want to be the one put into the role of executioner. So Jesus' answer here is brilliant. The perfect way out of this trap. They can't accuse him of defying the law of Moses because he does give them permission. But at the same time, he creates a situation where the focus of judgment shifts. And so he gives these men, these scribes and Pharisees, somebody else to judge first. Like he's saying, oh, you're so eager to judge and condemn somebody? Well, let me give you somebody to judge. And who does he offer them? Themselves. So that's the principle here. When I see the mistakes of others, I should judge myself first. I should judge myself instead. I should focus on my sins and weaknesses. I should realize that I, too, am guilty. It's the motes and beams idea from, from the Sermon on the Mount, played out in real life. And so these men do judge themselves. And what's their verdict? Apparently, based on verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Their verdict? Guilty. They were convicted. Convicted by Christ? No, no. Convicted by their own consciences. And who knows what, what those men were guilty of, but, but they knew and they realized that they were in no position to be casting stones. And then I imagine that if we, we do that same little exercise ourselves, we'll come to the same realization and we'll have more compassion. We'll have more mercy for the mistakes of others and set down our stones. Now, verse 9, the accusers teach us the fourth truth about judging. What did they do after they'd been convicted by their own conscience? They went out one by one and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. They leave. They leave her with Jesus. And it's not until Jesus sees none but the woman, as it says in that next verse, that he deals with the situation. This is the way it should be. Like we said earlier, those situations should not be a matter of public scrutiny. So what should we do when we're tempted to judge? When I see the mistakes of others, I should leave the judgment to Christ. And interestingly enough, if we really stop and think about Jesus' condition for throwing the stone, it was, He who is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And I ask you, was there anybody in that courtyard that fit that qualification? Somebody who met that requirement. Somebody without sin. Yeah, there was Jesus himself. He was without sin, truly and completely. So if anybody would have been justified in throwing the first stone, it was him. The only one who can fairly and righteously and perfectly make those kind of judgments. And because he knows the person and the soul better than they know themselves. 
So let's put the matter into his hands, or the hands of those who've been called, appointed, and authorized by him to make those kinds of judgments. And how are those judgments carried out in the church today? In private, behind closed doors, dealt with as confidentially as possible. And from verse 10, I, I really do love that phrase, that Jesus saw none but the woman in verse 10. We're learning something about how Jesus sees people. Those scribes and Pharisees, all they saw was a sinner, an adulteress, a, an opportunity to accuse Jesus. But Jesus saw the woman, the person, the individual. He saw her. And I hope that's what we seek to see in others. The person behind the problem. The soul behind the sin. So when I see the mistakes of others, I should seek to see the woman or the man behind the mistake. Right? See the person, not the problem. Now, what do we make of the rest of the story? Uh, from verse 11 here. Does Jesus condone adultery? Is he telling her it's not that big a deal? Uh, does Jesus forgive her right there and then? When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So which of the following do you feel best reflects how Jesus is handling her sin? Because there's no doubt that she has sinned, and seriously, grievously. Which of the following do you feel best describes Jesus' judgment? Is the message tolerance? What you did is not that big a deal. Don't worry about it. Or is the message acquittal? I forgive you of your mistake. The charges have been dropped. Is the message warning? I'm not going to condemn you for this, but don't let it happen again. Is the message encouragement? You have value in God's eyes. You don't have to live like this anymore. Or is the message challenge? I invite you to change. The evidence of forgiveness is a changed life. So which of those would you choose? And you could choose more than just one. Personally, I lean towards the last three options and away from the first two. I don't see anything in those verses that suggests a disregard for sin or automatic forgiveness. Jesus isn't condoning or minimizing the seriousness of adultery here. He just doesn't condemn her. I feel there's a good mix of warning, encouragement, and challenge in that short five-word phrase, go and sin no more. So what should we do when we're offered a chance to judge? When I see the mistakes of others, I should not condemn. I'm not going to issue a final judgment on somebody and their value, but should give them a chance to change. And, and there you go. Six powerful principles of judgment, of, of righteous judgment. I want to show you something really cool. I'm so grateful for the Joseph Smith translation, because without it, we would never know the rest of the story. We'd be left to wonder if, if she changed or not. Did this experience with the Savior's mercy have an impact on her? Or did she just run away from that courtyard relieved that she was able to escape that situation and go right back to her old ways? I think our Heavenly Father wanted the members of His restored church to get the benefit of one more principle, one more truth from the story. And so He inspired Joseph to add this little phrase to the end of verse 11. Which, by the way, if you have an older version of the New Testament. It's not included in the footnotes, which always used to blow my mind. Like, of all the JSTs to leave out, why would they not include this one? So I'm grateful that they realized this, and, and they've added it now to the newer version 
uh, of the scriptures. So now there is a footnote 811C, which changes verse 11 to read like this. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. So she changed. She glorified God. She believed in Jesus. His mercy changed her. So our final truth from this beautiful story, mercy and constructive counsel are more likely to produce change in a person than condemnation and public shame. So a, a recap of our truths here. When I see the mistakes of others, I shouldn't set them in the midst. I should seek to ignore it. I should judge myself instead. I should leave the judgment to Christ. I should seek to see the person, not the problem. And I should condemn them not, but give them a chance to change. And, and before we conclude, there is another perspective that, that, that we should consider in this story. This story not only helps us when we are tempted to judge others, but also when we are the ones looking up at the crowd around us as the sinner. When we are the ones in the position to be judged. Look at the story from that perspective, and, and that will be powerful as well. How does Christ, or how will Christ, treat us? Jesus will not condemn me for my sins, but he'll be merciful, and he'll offer me, I believe, numerous second chances to overcome my sins. So to liken the scriptures here, how could this story help you treat others more like Jesus? And, and how will it do that for you in the future? And how does the way Jesus treated this woman help you face your own sins? And, and my friends, I, I think that we can all accept the fact that we're sinners and that none of us wants to have our sins and weaknesses and embarrassing matters paraded before the world. I hope that we can remember the Savior's example when we're tempted to judge or condemn the people around us for their wrongdoings. The result we desire most is changed people, people that glorify God from that hour, and not broken souls battered by our stones of condemnation. And may we also remember the Savior's actions when we find ourselves in the position of this woman, caught in the very act by a God who sees and knows all, whatever our mistakes may be. And, and I hope that we'll remember that he's merciful, that he's slow to condemn, that he sees us and not just our sins. I encourage us to keep in mind the Savior's words to this woman. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Our next story from John chapter 9, The Man Born Blind. And as an icebreaker, I like to begin by taking a class survey. I ask, which of the following senses do you feel would be the worst to lose. Hearing, taste, touch, sight, or smell. And then take a vote and see which answer comes out to be the most popular. And I've done this activity many times with my classes and almost without fail, the most popular answer is sight. Most people feel that being blind would be the most difficult sense to lose. And you might ask some of them to explain why they think that would be so hard. Today, we're going to study a story about a young man who had never seen anything in his life, a man born blind, and his incredible experience with the Savior. Sometimes certain chapters in the scriptures carry themes, and especially the Gospel of John. I would argue that the theme of this chapter and, and, and much of his gospel is seeing. 
And here, seeing is symbolic of believing and understanding. So it shouldn't surprise you which I am statement that Jesus is going to use in this chapter. You know, Jesus gave us quite a few I am statements in his ministry. I am the bread of life. I am the way. I am the good shepherd. I am Alpha and Omega. Well, in this context, a story about healing a blind man, a man who's lived his entire life in darkness. What famous I am statement do you think Jesus is going to use here? Can you guess it? Now go to John 9, verse 5, to see if you got it right. And what does he say? As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Did you get it right? <laughs> so let's see how Jesus brings light into the life of this young man, both physically and spiritually. And first, I find the way that Jesus heals the blind man really fascinating. What did Jesus have the blind man do in order to receive his sight? Verses 6 and 7. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, why do you think Jesus healed the blind man like this? Why not just heal him on the spot with the touch of his hand? He healed a lot of other people in that way. So why like this here? Well, it could teach us that if we wish to see in a spiritual sense, then we too need to follow the specific instructions of the Savior. Also, I believe that the clay can be symbolic as well. Uh, the clay is from the earth right? The world. So I believe the clay symbolizes the world or the things of the world. Therefore, if we wish to see, we need to wash away the dirt, wash away the filthiness, the, the cloudiness of our worldly concerns and desires. And then we'll see. We'll see the light. And then what happens next is so awesome. After the man washes and sees, Jesus is nowhere to be found. He's walked away and disappeared into the crowds. Well, as you can imagine, this miracle is going to cause quite a stir amongst the people, uh, the people who know him, and they realize that this, this incredible miracle. So I like to approach the story by saying that this story is going to show us how people often respond to the light of Jesus Christ and his truth. This man has just experienced that power. He has seen and felt Christ's light. Now, what's he going to do with it? And how are the other people going to respond to this evidence of Christ as the light of the world? And so at this point, I might consider showing my class the church Bible video of this story. It's very well done because this is such a, such a dramatic story. And, and I love that it follows the scriptures basically word for word. So I'll provide you with a link to it here. But as they watch or as they read it, invite them to consider the following three questions. Maybe I'd just write them up on the board. How is the man born blind a good example of what we should do when we have experienced Christ's light? How are the Pharisees a bad example of what to do when we see evidence of Christ's light? And what happened to the man's faith in Christ as the story progresses? So if you haven't ever read this story or, or seen the video, I encourage you to pause and do that now with those questions in mind. And how is the man born blind a good example? He stands up for the truth. He, he, he's experienced this great evidence of Christ's power in his life. And so he testifies of it over and over again, with boldness. And so should we. And how are the Pharisees a bad example? They make excuses, and they seek to rationalize away the miracle, even when it was obvious that this thing was done by the power of God. It just makes you want to hit your head and say, really? 
their main hang up is that Jesus has done the miracle on the Sabbath. He does that a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> well, he's trying to teach the Pharisees that lesson. To them, Jesus making the clay was work. And the man washing away the clay was work. And that's not acceptable on the Sabbath. And talk about looking beyond the mark. And so their conclusion, uh, this man must be a sinner. And in the case your students struggle to see this, let's just go through the story together and I'll show you examples of these two responses. And you might even encourage your students to mark these two responses in two different colors in their scriptures labeled testimonies and rationalizations. So the Pharisees first rationalization shows up in verse 16. This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. And then we have the man born blinds response to that excuse. His first declaration of testimony. In verse 17, he is a prophet. That's his conclusion about this miracle. The man who did this, he's got to be a prophet at least. I mean, this is such an amazing miracle in his life that he can't help but immediately come to the conclusion that Jesus is more than just an ordinary man. That's not good enough for the Pharisees. So we get rationalization number two in verses 18 through 23, which is, oh, he must not really have been born blind then. Uh, he's lying. Go get his parents and let's verify this. So they do. They go and get his parents and ask, is this your son? And was he really born blind? And they say, yes, this is our son. And yes, he was born blind. But we don't know how this happened. Ask him. He's of age. So, so that rationalization falls flat. Then we get excuse number three in verse 24. They say, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. So God did the miracle, but, but not through Jesus. Jesus had nothing to do with it. So the man born blind responds with another testimony. He's, he's just not going to let them get away with it. He says, and you can almost sense the tone here. Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. And I'm sure that the people around him are like, yeah, that's a pretty good indicator that this man is good. I think the Pharisees are seeing that they're, they're starting to lose face. And so they question him again. How did this happen? And I just love the courage of this young man. He testifies in verse 27. And there's a really good JST change that I'll, that I'll add here. He says, I've told you already, and you did not believe it. Wherefore, would you believe it if I told you again? Will you also be his disciples? Wow, that, this, this is direct, right? He's obviously getting a little fed up with the, the pride and the sheer ignorance of the Pharisees in this. Now they sense his indignation and they revile him. And we get excuse number four in verses 28 through 29. Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. But as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. So, so he must have done this miracle by some other power then. But, but we, we're Moses' disciples. Ah, I, I just love this young man. Such a good example. He's not going to just quietly walk away. He is going to stand up to their blindness. These are my favorite verses of the whole story. Just listen to, to the power in this testimony. He says, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Oh, it's just like, yeah, take that, Pharisees. And their last dig or their last excuse comes in verse 34. Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Which is which is typical of most unbelievers or opponents of faith. Their, their last resort, dismiss the witness. We can't explain the miracle, so 
we'll just label you as crazy or a deceiver or an imposter. We don't have to listen to you. You were just a sinner to begin with, which was, which was a popular opinion in those days of those that were born with, with defects or, or handicaps. They, they attributed that to sin or, or a sign of God's displeasure with them. So they, they blind themselves. That's what the Pharisees are doing here. They are blinding themselves willingly to the truth, which is, which is very ironic here. Now, all throughout the story, we're seeing those two responses to the light. We can either rationalize it away, dismiss it, make excuses, or we can accept it, testify of it, and stand up for it with boldness. And so that leads us to our third question here. What happened to the man's faith as the story progresses? Every time he testified, it got stronger. You sense his conviction grow and grow, and his commitment as a disciple of this man that he's never physically seen deepen. So the truth to this story, the more I testify of Christ and his light, the stronger my faith becomes. And the then the conclusion of this story in verses 35 to 38 is really beautiful. I wish I could have been there to see this moment. It says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And, and remember, he doesn't recognize Jesus at this point physically. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Oh, superb. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, why should we be more like the blind man and not the Pharisees? Because those who are willing to stand up for what they believe and boldly testify will one day see and know with 100% clarity that it's true. And I also believe that the Savior himself will one day stand in front of those who have believed in him and who have testified of him and confirm all that they've stood for. So do you see the, the amazing irony that the powerful message of the story? We started the story with a blind man who receives sight. And we end the story with a man who not only sees physically, but more importantly, sees spiritually. While the Pharisees, who could always see physically, are exposed as the blind. Just in case we missed that message, Jesus makes sure we get the point in verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. So, so to liken the scriptures here, how's your spiritual vision? If you were to compare it to the following eyesight conditions, which best describes you? 2020? Nearsighted? Always focused just on what's right in front of you? Farsighted? always focused on something in the future? Do you have a couple of blind spots? Are you going blind? Or do you feel that you're blind? And then, how has your testimony grown by standing up for it? Now, the, man, the man born blind is just one of my favorite examples of testimony in the scriptures. Testimony is power. Whenever it's proclaimed, it releases that power, both outward and inward. When we have had that clay of the world washed away from our eyes and we, and we see, we rush out into the world to celebrate and proclaim that magnificent miracle to all around us. Like you can imagine, a man born blind seeing for the first time. And may we realize the light by which we see the light of the world, our Savior Jesus Christ. 
I mean, that testimony is going to grow stronger and stronger. Our vision becomes clearer and clearer as we stay true to that witness. And just like us, that man saw Jesus spiritually first before he ever saw him physically. We too, we can believe in Christ and have a deep conviction of his divinity without ever actually seeing him with our physical eyes. But one day, I believe that we too will stand before the Savior himself and he'll declare, Thou hast both seen him, both spiritually and now physically, and it is he that talketh with thee. Until that day, continue to testify, no matter how strong or intimidating the opposition. All right, a shorter message here from, from John chapter 10. And for an icebreaker, I would play, Whose Voice Is This? And all you really need to do to play this with your classes is a phone or, or a laptop with access to the church's website or the Gospel Library app. And you're going to go in and you find the most recent general conference. And then you can select a talk from one of the apostles. And at the top of the page, there'll be a video of the talk. And you just play a small portion of it and see if they can recognize who it is by only listening to their voice. And I would use this handout as a study guide for, for this portion of the lesson. And you'll see that at the top there that there's a place to write down their answers. And I'd, I'd suggest that you make sure to choose some of the brethren whose voices are, are really unique and recognizable if I can say that, like Elder Uchtdorf, uh, President Oaks, Elder Ballard, President Nelson, Elder Sawadis, but really, really any of the brethren will do. And then when you're done, you can go through and correct them. And you know, if the theme of John chapter 9 was seeing the Savior, then John chapter 10 is all about hearing him. And as we've just demonstrated, Everybody's voice is unique. And, and with those voices in the activity that you did recognize, why was it that you were able to do that? It's because you've heard their voices before. At least every six months, you've heard them enough to identify the owner of that voice. Now, if you couldn't recognize them, perhaps you haven't had enough experience with listening to that particular person enough to distinguish them from the others. Well, Jesus had a little metaphor that he used to help his apostles understand the importance of getting to know his voice. What did Jesus compare himself to in John chapter 10, verse 11 and 14? He compared himself to a shepherd, but not just any kind of shepherd, a good shepherd, which means what's he comparing all of us to? Sheep. Now, having been somebody who's actually worked with sheep on a ranch as a young man, I'm not totally sure that's a compliment, <laughs> to be honest. Sheep are not the most intelligent of animals. But this chapter is mainly going to revolve around that image of Jesus as a good shepherd. So with that analogy in mind, let's search for what Jesus wants us to know about him and what he wants us to know about ourselves. So the next portion of the handout contains two separate crossword puzzles. To complete and some questions. Uh, one crossword puzzle for each of the two major symbols, the good shepherd and the sheep. And the clues for the crossword puzzles are going to highlight the important qualities that those things possess. So first, the good shepherd. How is Jesus like that? To a cross, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. For a cross, he calleth his own sheep by name. Seven a cross, he leadeth them out. Eight a cross, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then one down, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Three down, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep five down, and I give unto them 
eternal life, and they shall never perish. And six down, he goeth before them. Now, as you look over each of those statements, pick your favorite one. And what does it teach you about Christ? My favorite one is that he calls his sheep by name. He knows us. He knows us by name. We're not just a number. We're not just another face in the crowd. Jesus loves and leads and knows us as individuals. And that's a comforting truth for me. That's Jesus' part. He's our shepherd who does so much for us. He protects us. He leads us. He lays down his life for us so that we can all have a more abundant life. And I, I love that. Jesus wants us all to have abundance, uh, good lives, happy lives. So he was willing to give up his in order to provide that for us. I have a little statue in my office of Jesus holding a lamb. And I keep it there to remind me of the gentle, compassionate, and caring nature of my Savior. And now let's turn our attention to the other symbol, us as his sheep. This one's a bit shorter. So three across, a stranger will they not follow. Four across, the sheep follow him. One down, the sheep hear his voice. And two down, they know his voice. So what's our part in this relationship then? We've got to hear his voice and follow that voice. And there's really only one way that we get to know somebody's voice, isn't there? You've got to spend time with them. You've got to speak to them. You've got to get to know them. Then when you hear their voice, you, you know who it is without them even identifying themselves. I mean, actually picture this. Maybe you've even had something like this happen before. Let's say that you come to the door of your house late at night and you find it locked. And so you knock on it and perhaps one of your family members comes to the door and they'll ask, who is it? Now, how would you respond? I'm guessing that you would probably respond by saying, it's me, right? Although if you stop to think about it, that's kind of a silly way to put it, isn't it? What, what does that mean? It's me. That doesn't tell them who you are at all. You're not identifying yourself by name. But I'm guessing that it would work, right? I'm guessing that they would probably let you in immediately. Why? Because they recognize your voice. It's unique. It's distinct. Each voice out there is just as different as our fingerprints. So now if the sheep metaphor isn't doing much for you, let me give you an alternate one because... I think most of us don't spend a lot of time around sheep and shepherds anymore. But I do imagine that a lot of you out there have dogs. And maybe we could, we could translate this as the parable of the good dog owner. Let's say we went to the church building and we put your dog in a room on one side of the church. And I went into another room on the other side of the building and then you in yet another. And we both started calling out to your dog. Who would he go to? Who would he run to first? He'd go to you, right? And why? Because he knows your voice. You feed him. You take care of him. You spend time with him. So he'll go to you. What's, what's the lesson then? Well, how well do you know the voice of the good dog owner or the good shepherd? If he called out to you from heaven right now, would you recognize him? Have you spent enough time with him? Do you feast on what he has to feed you? His words. And there's a cross reference that I might share at this point. Mosiah 5 verses 12 through 13. I say unto you, I would that you should remember to retain the name written always in your hearts that you are not found on the left hand of God, but that you hear and know the voice by which you shall be called, and also the name by which he shall call you. For how knoweth the man the master whom he has not served, and who is a stranger unto him, 
and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart. For one day, symbolically speaking, Jesus Christ is going to call for us. He'll say, all those who bear my name come out of the world. And if we've spent our lives getting to know that voice and hearing it in the scriptures, in the voices of the living prophets, in the promptings of the Spirit, and if, as the book of Mosiah suggests, we've, we've spent our lives serving him and our thoughts and the intents of our hearts are close to him, then we might respond, ah, I know that voice. That's the voice of my master. I've spent my whole life getting to know that voice, hearing that voice. I'll go to him now and we'll be saved. We'll be protected. But if we haven't spent our lives getting to know that voice, if we've spent our lives focusing on and heeding the voice of strangers, the voices of the world, celebrities, the politicians, the so-called experts, if we've spent little time hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd, in the scriptures, and in the voices of the living prophets, and in the promptings of the Spirit, then we might say, who's that? I don't know that voice. I'm going to stay right here. And there we'll be vulnerable. So the truth here, Jesus Christ knows, loves, leads, cares for, protects me, and has laid down his life for me like a good shepherd. If I hear him and follow him, I will have an abundant life. So a couple of like in the scriptures questions you might consider. When do you feel you've heard the voice of the good shepherd? What things do you do to better hear him? What could you do to get to know the voice of the good shepherd better? Or how do you discern his voice from all the others that vie for your attention? Well, I bear witness that Jesus Christ knows us by name, that he loves us, and that he was willing to lay down his life for us, because we are his precious sheep. And, and I invite us to make hearing his voice a priority in our lives, instead of filling our lives with the voices of strangers. Let's spend the majority of our time really getting to know the gentle and loving voice of our Savior. And I can promise that if we do, when it really matters most, at the end of days, when he calls out to his flock, we'll recognize that voice and we'll enjoy an abundant life in much greener pastures than we now inhabit with our good shepherd for eternity. Now, now those are the big three principles that I would choose to cover if that's all the time that I had. But one final quick activity suggestion for chapters 7 and 8, which, which we didn't really cover very much. Uh, these two chapters contain a wide variety of Jesus' teachings to the Pharisees at the temple. And we're not going to cover those deeply here. But there are some really great one-liners in these chapters that I feel are worthy of our attention. And one way to highlight these statements would be to do the following puzzle activity. I call it the power phrases from the Prince of Peace puzzle. And so what you'll do is you print out as many of these puzzles that you need, uh, depending on the size of your class, and cut them up into their individual pieces or squares. But be sure to print an extra one that isn't cut up so that you can use that as your answer key. And then take each puzzle's pieces and place them into envelopes to keep them separated. And then divide up your class into teams of two to four students. I find four works well. And challenge them to be the first team to successfully assemble the puzzle. And it's not your traditional kind of puzzle. What they're need, going to need to do is, is match up the edges with scripture references from these two chapters with the power phrase that's found within that verse. A red line on one or two sides of the square indicates that it's part of the border of the puzzle. So when they think they've successfully completed it, it should look like this. And then you can offer a reward to the fastest team, teens. And if you feel you have time after the activity is done, 
you can encourage your students to go through the scriptures and mark each of these power phrases. Now, you're also going to notice that the phrases come in two different colors. And that's because I've divided up the statements into two different categories or two types of power phrases that I like to focus on. The statements in blue are teaching statements. Doctrines are truths that the Savior teaches. And then the statements in green are what I would call the I statements. These are things that Jesus says about himself that I find inspiring. Because they're statements that we should all seek to be able to say about ourselves as well since we've all been invited to become like Christ. This is a which of those statements would you like to be able to say? And in here are all the statements, all the teachings in one place, all 24 of them. So first, the teaching statements. From 717, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. 724, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Verse 37, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. 8.12. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Verse 32. And he shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 34. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. 836. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. 839. Do the works of Abraham. Verse 51. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And now the I statements. Again, just imagine how powerful it would be if we could say these same things about ourselves. 729. I know him for I am from him, and he hath sent me. 733. I go unto him that sent me. 812. I am the light of the world. 814. I know whence I came, and whither I go. Think of that one in terms of the plan of salvation. 815. I judge no man. 816. I am not alone. 823. I am not of this world. Wouldn't that be great for us to be able to say that we, we are not of the world, that we're in the world, but not of the world. 826. I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. 828. I do nothing of myself, but as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. 829. I love this one. I do always those things that please him. 845. I tell you the truth. 849. I honor my father. 850. I seek not mine own glory. 855. I know him and keep his saying. Now, once you've completed the puzzle activity, you can display these phrases and invite your students to pick their favorites and to be prepared to share why they chose that statement. And if I had the time to just choose one to focus on with you here, I think it would be that truth that's taught in John 7:17. 7, Such a critical principle to understand about testimony. It reveals the true order of testimony. I think a lot of us get this process backwards. Uh, we assume that the order of testimony is no, then do. Once I know something is true, then I'll act on it. That's the way of the world. Somebody might say, I don't believe in the Book of Mormon, so why read it? A member of the church might claim, I, I don't pay my tithing because I don't really have a testimony of that principle yet. No, no, no. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So I read the Book of Mormon, and then I can gain a testimony of it. I pay my tithing, then I will gain a testimony of tithing. I express my faith and trust in God's word or the words of his prophets, and I seek to live those things. Then Jesus promises that the conviction will come. But it starts with action, not knowledge. As President Oaks once said, we should remember that acquiring a testimony 
is not a passive thing, but a process in which we are expected to do something. And that will do it for this week, uh, my, my fellow teachers out there. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time with me uh, as we study the scriptures. I hope that you felt the spirit and that you plan to apply uh, what you've learned here into your life. If you feel like this was helpful, I invite you to share it with others who you feel it could also help. As I always say, uh, for teachers out there, if you're new to the channel, uh, if you'd like access to some of the resources that I put together for teachers, handouts, uh, uh, you could use some of the slides in your lessons if you prefer. Uh, you can go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links where you can, you can get access to those materials. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.